Okay, finishing up our last uh, video here for chapter nine, uh, Byzantine uh, Empire, but also emerging Europe with the Byzantines and the Crusades. The Byzantines, uh, this was, of course, the eastern part of what was the Roman Empire that Diocletian divided into two parts. Uh, this becomes known as the Byzantine Empire after the fall of the western part of the empire in 476. Now, the most famous Byzantine emperor is a guy by the name of Justinian. He ruled the Byzantine Empire at its height, at its largest point and the greatest extent of power, and actually retook most of what was the western part of the Roman Empire. Uh, this is the empire of the Byzantines at the time of Justinian's death. And you see all this area in pink, which included most of what was the Roman Empire uh, in southern uh, Spain, all the way across North Africa, through is uh, Egypt, all the way through uh, Jerusalem and the Holy Land, uh, all of what was the Ottoman Empire, uh, the Greeks. Uh, actually, at one point before his death, uh, he actually sends it into uh, Spain and through the Frankish kingdoms, but by the time of his death, he has lost some of that territory. Okay. He actually, early on in his career, uh, survived a civil war with the, his, the support of his wife, Theodora. Uh, his advisors advised him to leave, flee the city with them. Uh, she tells him he should stay and make a stand. Uh, he does stay, makes a stand, uh, and is successful, and as a result becomes beloved of his people and a great emperor along with that. This is Justinian and his wife, Theodora, here. Uh, he grew up from a sort of poor peasant stock to go on to become emperor, sort of a rags to riches story, if you will. She grew up from being an actress to becoming the emperor. That may not sound too extravagant in our day and time, but back then, um, actresses were oftentimes also prostitutes. Not saying she was, but that is something that they were associated with being. Okay. Justinian is famous also for a, appointing a commission uh, that has the local laws combined, which results in something called the Corpus of Civil Law. Corpus meaning referring to body. Uh, this is Justinian. There are his advisors. He picks what he finds are the, the best minds, uh, legal minds and scholars of the time to uh, be on his commission. And they create this, the Corpus Juris Civilis, as we said again, the uh, Corpus of Civil Law, sometimes referred to as Justinian's Code. Going on to look at uh, the Crusades a little bit here. A crusade, this were these military expeditions to regain the Holy Land. Uh, we talked about those in class, and I'll probably later on uh, record that uh, for future classes, that uh, PowerPoint we went through in class today. Uh, the Crusades were called for for uh, three main reasons. A, free the Holy Land from Muslim control because the Christians decided we need to get that back. Uh, secondly, we want to aid the Byzantines in Constantinople. These guys are still Christians, uh, and we want to help them in, in their struggle against the Muslims. And we hope to heal, heal rather that split between the church in the East and the West, in the East, the Eastern Orthodox Church, the Byzantines, and in the West, the Roman Catholic Church. Okay, now peasants are enticed to this by several things. A, a freedom from those feudal bonds, those ties that might have uh, tied them to the estate if they were a serf or the, the obligations they required uh, under feudal law. This would free them from those to become sort of freemen uh, and a chance to have their own land. Uh, there's a promise of immediate salvation. If you die, if you kill uh, or die on the uh, uh, Crusades, it's straight to heaven for you. So that's a, a get out of you know hell free card, so to speak. And there's also the possibility of becoming wealthy. I'm not going to get to become a noble. That's a misconception. But I might get enough wealth to come home and buy land or start a business and have, again, better control of my life. Now, kings and the Pope, uh, these guys are after some power. The Pope trying to uh, exercise his power over the kings by getting them to come do his bidding, so to speak. And he's actually hoping to, uh, you know, take over control of the eastern part of the uh, uh, Christian Christian faith, the, the Eastern Orthodox part. Uh, the kings want to gain power for themselves to become more powerful kings than they already are. Okay, looking at the Crusades, we've got the uh, what the Muslims call the Christians infidels, unbelievers, infidel, uh, meaning they don't believe in Muhammad and the latest revelation. Uh, Christians were to call the Muslims heretics, someone who don't believe official church teachings because, well, Muhammad's not part of that. And the most famous of the Muslim generals uh, in the Crusades is a guy by the name of Saladin, Saladin the Magnificent. 
who said he's the guy who unites the Muslim forces and eventually defeats the Crusaders. That's what we we'll need to know for your study guide. Okay, here's Saladin uh, on his very cushy throne here, uh, meeting the bishop, the bishop of Salisbury. And then, of course, one of our most famous uh, crusader kings is Richard I, Richard the Lionheart, son of uh, Henry II, uh, brother of King John. He's the crusader king that struggles on alone against Saladin, as we said today in class. That was the third crusade, the crusade of the three kings. Uh, uh, Barbarossa from Germany drowns in a river. Philip from um, uh, France gets mad and goes home. Uh, Richard struggles on alone. Now realize Richard is really more French than English, doesn't even speak English, although he becomes the king of England. And there's Richard there looking quite magnificent in battle. Okay. Now, really, one of the importance of the Crusades, and this is something we need to know, and this is from the PowerPoint in class, but there were other attempts uh, after the Fourth Crusade, which was a complete disaster up until 1270. More attempts, none of these are successful in getting back into the Holy Land. Uh, the last of the four Crusader states falls in 1291, uh, and that's sort of the end of their attempts to control that area until much later. It was, however, an expression of European power outside of Europe for the first time since the fall of the Roman Empire in the West in 476. It also familiarizes them with Islam and the Byzantine world and their expansion of Greek and Roman knowledge. While the monks may have preserved that knowledge in copying those books down, they were mostly locked away from public consumption because they weren't important for uh, the future world. They thought more of the Bible was important for that. So the church is controlling knowledge, so to speak. But the merchants who take the crusaders down there uh, start trading and they see these things and interactions and, and get some more things. Uh, more knowledge comes back and, and information, and there's going to be a radical change in Europe as a result of the Crusades. Uh, it also strengthens the role of the church, at least in the West, because there are actually a lot of nobles die uh, on Crusades. And the result, that's going to help strengthen the hierarchy of the church over the other remaining nobles. However, it will also lead to more powerful monarchs in Europe because some of the nobles, their you know, lords that served beneath them are now gone, and so they'll start consolidating that land back into their own holdings. And also importantly, it will enrich Italy, the Italian city-states. We talked about Venice in class uh, and their use of the Fourth Crusade to crush their rivals and sack Constantinople, which we're supposed to be trying to help, and I'm not sure how that really works. But anyway, uh, that will lead to a rebirth of knowledge and desire of knowledge and wisdom and building and success and art uh, in Europe that will come to become later known as the Renaissance. That's all for Chapter 9. That should answer all the questions on your study guide. Any questions, see me in class.